Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's a great pleasure to come to MSR Bangalore finally. I've been wanting to come for many years now. Um, so this is based on uh, mainly on our recent CAV paper, uh, which appeared. It's joint work with my student, Alex Chakarov, who's uh, also very interested. And he's uh, contributed a lot to this, this uh, project. Um, and uh, it also involves some previous work done. And I put Sumit's name in red, because he's an MSR uh, person as well. Uh, Right, so I'll be talking about these and I'll try and omit a lot of the tedious details and, and just give you the high level picture. Uh, if you have more questions, you know, I'll try and keep it informal. Please just stop me, ask questions. Okay, so what are probabilistic programs? I don't think I need quite to introduce what probabilistic programs are to this audience, but let me do so anyway. These are programs which instead of non-determinism, you replace it with random numbers. Uh, the ability to generate random numbers is there in every language. So if you look at Python or Camel, C, C++, .NET, you always have constructors for generating pseudo-random numbers. But let's imagine for this talk that they are perfect random numbers. They are not pseudo-random, they are perfect random. Doesn't make any difference for us. And you can think of a program like this where x gets a uniform random value that's uniformly distributed between minus 5 and 4. It can be real, it can be integer. And, and you have the same programming constructs, your while programming constructs. You can have branches that can flip a coin with probability two-thirds take the branch, with probability one-thirds not take the branch. Right? So the goal of this talk is to study stochastic systems which are de designed in terms of these programs because these are mathematically stochastic systems. They are random systems and we would like to understand these systems exactly the way we understand programs. Okay, so and let me give you the target of what we are after. So one of the targets, and there will be two, I'll introduce the second one. One of the targets is we want to answer queries. Queries could be at the end of the program, let's estimate the probability of x being greater than or equal to 9. Okay? In, in a regular program, you would put an assert there and you would say, what's the probability that the assertion fails or not? In a probabilistic program, you, you want to know the answer to the probability. In a, in a regular program, you just want to know whether it fails or not. Okay, so, so you can have these queries, and our goal is to calculate these queries. Uh, the second goal is to think about termination of these programs. Okay? Question is, does this program terminate? Under what sense can you think about termination of these programs? And I'll talk a little bit about how do you talk about termination of probabilistic programs, what's almost sure termination, and how do you find proofs of almost sure termination? Okay, so we'll. Uh, what so supposing the while loop is not terminating, uh, and if you want to estimate the probability, what is the semantics of doing that? Uh, so I'll I'll talk a little bit about that. Right now, I'll I'll talk about termination in the sense that either the program terminates on on all behaviors, or if it doesn't terminate, then I'll show I'll give you a proof system that shows that the measure of non-terminating behavior is zero. We call it almost sure termination. So, so we don't think about probability of termination just yet. I haven't done that work. Uh, but so my question was, I mean, supposing the loop never terminates, and you want to estimate the probability of something that happens after it. Then it's ill-defined. So, so you assume that when you ask these kinds of questions, uh, then the, the loop has at least one terminating behavior. Otherwise, in measure theory, the empty set is not allowed to have a measure. So, so it's ill-defined. You don't have an answer. But so more generally, it may estimate the probability among terminating runs? Assuming yes, it's assuming it's probability conditioned on termination. Right? So you are estimating probability x greater than or equal to 9, conditioned on the fact that control actually reaches the end of the program, or wherever you put the assertion right, in the program. I'm just putting it at the end to keep things easier. You had a question, Srinam? That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Right. So, right. So first thing I'll point out is that there is no reason really to look at this problem in you know the, this is a very well known problem it can be solved quite easily just by running the program we often lose sight of that what can be done by just running the program and here you can actually solve this by running the program many 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 times you get a great estimate of the answer okay i wanted to state that up front which 
which is you know true of probabilistic programs just by running it you get lots of good information and probability after all is number of successes by number of trials okay um, but we want to do something better because when you run the program many 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 times the answer you get is statistical in nature right and and that's how things have been done for many years now I mean for hundreds of years now and the question is can we now start to think about a static analysis sensibility to this problem where we can place actual upper and lower bounds on the probability much like in static analysis we want to try and get the best kind of bounds that you can place on the actual probability and, and if you get very tight bounds then, then you win if you don't get very tight bounds maybe you put in more computation and you get tighter bounds right so, so that's the kind of algorithms that we want to get at where the actual probability is somewhere between a lower bound and an upper bound Okay, and that's going to be the goal of answering the queries not estimating the value statistically which you can always do by running the program and, and using your favorite statistical test we want to do something more al along the lines of static analysis okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll explore an approach in this, pro in this talk on how to do that okay. the second thing is let's talk about termination okay, so if you think about this program and you think about the non-deterministic semantics of all the random variables which is usually what tools do when they find rand they treat it as non-determinism verification tools you treat it as non-deterministic choice right and if you do so then this program is non-terminating very easy to see there is one branch here that does nothing to the value of x and y and you can keep taking that branch forever and you will never terminate right in that sense this program is non-terminating but in this talk we'll talk about putting in the probabilistic semantics and we'll show that this program actually terminates with probability 1 and this is called almost sure termination okay and, and we'll talk about how do you prove that a program even though it may be non-terminating in the actual semantics in the non-deterministic semantics is almost sure terminating in the probabilistic semantics yes so one question I have is actually whether this kind of analysis is actually needed at all to answer the questions that you had in the previous slide which is um, oh. calculating properties are lower bounds and upper bounds. The, oh no, ter termination, termination is, is orthogonal, okay. right? It's like correctness, partial correctness, total correctness, right? So like you said, we say that this probability of something holds given the fact that you reach there. Now on the side, if you prove that the program is almost surely terminating, then you have completed the picture, right? And another thing is termination is an independent question all by itself, right? So, so we want to look at both angles which is uh, establishing partial correctness like properties estimating probabilities establishing total correctness like properties which also in requires you to talk about termination so the reason why I mentioned this also is that um, in some of the uh, examples that we have been looking at um, you know in addition to having sampling um, uh, conditioning which actually is observations which is sort of the probabilistic equivalent of the assumed statement correct also seems quite important right uh, you know you have some uh, uh, sampling that's right some computation and then you want to readjust your distributions based on observations you that's get right from the real that's data, right and uh, one way to think about observations is actually is you think what is not terminating in the sense that if an observation is not satisfied then you uh, don't terminate yeah you don't terminate so in those cases actually there are programs where you know it is not necessarily bad that under certain conditions the program True. does not terminate True. that's part of the model yes so so right now i'm i'm not looking at that that part of it that's that's a more bayesian view of the world this is a more frequentist view of the world so so there is needs to be some work to be done to kind of understand what's different between the Bayesian view of the world and frequentist view of the world but in this talk I'm going to take this view of the world where I'll, I'll assume that the program you're trying to reason about is almost surely terminating and I want to find a proof of almost sure termination I'll, I'll show you how these proofs look like okay so so uh, that's going to be the, the agenda for this talk right so I mean let me quickly go over some of the some of the applications of doing this kind of work so one main application is is what we call robustness of programs so there are lots of systems that compute risks uh, risk of earthquake occurring in a certain place uh, risk that the earth is warming and and when you look at these computations they are a computations based on uncertain data the data that comes into these computations is not known to a certainty it's data that's 
uncertain in the nature by which you collect data it's uncertain so for example if an insurance company wants to say should I insure this person and how much should their premium be right if you and companies are using programs to do this kind of calculation like right? large risk calculating programs right and and the kind of data they take in our lab values which will always depend on you know when you measure the lab values and the statistical error in the test that you're using to measure lab values uh, lifestyle parameters which could be you know noted down wrongly uh, life expectancy data which could have errors in it and so you're computing based on erroneous data and the question of robustness is what how does the noise in the data affect the decision so you want to perform an analysis to see like how does the noise affect the decision for every possible input or in general what are the inputs for which the noise can have an adverse effect on the decision right so those are questions that you can ask and there you have to compare two versions of the program a program which has the input data noise free computes a decision, input data with some unknown noise, computes a decision, and you want to know what's the probability that the two decisions diverge from each other. And that's an example of a probabilistic program. It's an example of the kind of querying that I just showed you in the previous slides. Uh, another example is state estimation, really common in control systems, where you have sensor data coming in, you do some kind of algorithms like Kalman filtering, sensor fusion algorithms. So, the, so you bring this on the, the noise itself will be modeled from that's right. So you, we assume that the noise, we know what kind of noise these lab tests are, are subject to. And that's, if you assume that the kind of errors that you're dealing with, at least the distribution of them is some, somehow known, then you can do this kind of analysis to say for every individual case, is it going to be robust or is, it, is the decision non-robust? And if it's non-robust, with what probability am I making the right decision, right? So, so you may, those are good questions to ask. And I think you can do program analysis and see if you can answer those questions. Another example is state estimation, very similar in flavor. You have sensor data that's coming in and based on the sensor data you estimate state. This is almost, if you fly in an aeroplane, drive a car, these are the kinds of algorithms that are constantly running in the background to estimate your speed, estimate your position, so on and so forth. Right? And the question again is how does noise in the sensor data affect the state estimate and in turn how does that affect the working of the system as a whole. Uh, there are tons of other applications. Uh, randomized algorithms are a classic application. Uh, I just mentioned sensor fusion algorithms. Uncertainty quantification is a big deal in space systems. They are interested in seeing if two satellites can collide. Uh, they are interested in calculating what the risk of it is and this is very relevant for us at Colorado because we are very close to the, the, the main control center for satellites called NORAD. Uh, scientific computation, you want to know the effect of round off errors. Tools like Austray assume the worst case in terms of the round off errors, but round off errors do have a documented nature where they are probabilistic, which is why when you run a computation it doesn't blow up after five steps, even though your static analyzer tells you correctly that it could blow up, right? So there is a randomness to round off errors as well. And if you analyze that you can see if, you know, how long can you continue to accumulate errors without without having a big variance in the, in the actual answer. So you can treat that uh, probabilistically. Anyway, so with those kinds of motivations, let's move on to what I'm going to talk about. So I'll give you a brief flavor of something called concentration of measure, which is the main phenomenon that we are going to attack. Okay, so it's what is different between non-determinism and randomness? The answer is concentration of measure. So we have to understand that. Then I'll talk about a deductive approach. So, so the PLDI paper we wrote was similar to, to Aditya and Sriram's work in the sense that we use symbolic execution along parts of the program. In this paper, what we are doing is we are looking at what is the notion of an invariant of a probabilistic program. So and we find the answer, uh, we propose the, a well-known answer called Martingales. Martingales are very well-known to probability, people in probability theory. And what we are proposing is these are the notion of an inductive invariant for a probabilistic program. Okay, and I'll show you how they work and, and why they should be the right notion of inductive invariance. Okay? Um, and I'll talk about super martingales and program termination. I'll show you that super martingales are like ranking functions. They behave like ranking functions and somehow you can use them to prove almost sure termination. Just like ranking functions prove termination on all behaviors, super martingales with some, some restrictions which I'll show prove almost sure termination and I'll show you it's very very similar to ranking functions just a few things have to change 
and then it becomes very naturally like a ranking function. Okay, and, and I'll show you a few applications, and then this is the strongest part of my talk, lots of unresolved questions. Uh, okay, so let me first highlight what concentration of measure is. Lots of books have been written about this, so I cannot do justice in one slide, but I'll try. Okay, so what is concentration of measure? So take a random program like this, which is purely stochastic, no non-determinism, and let's replace it everywhere randomness occurs with a non-deterministic choice. Okay, so this becomes a non-deterministic boolean, this becomes a non-deterministic number, and we'll preserve the ranges as they are. Okay, so what is the difference between the original program with randomness and the program with non-determinism? Okay, so if you send this program to your favorite abstract interpretation tool, whichever one you're using, then you get invariance. So you get invariance like count greater than or equal to zero, x plus y greater than or equal to minus seven, and so on. Okay, so the, the exact invariants are not as important as the invariant that's missing. Count less than or equal to something. You will never get an invariant like that unless your analyzer is wrong. Why is that? Because the nature of the program with non-determinism tells you that any value of count that you imagine is achievable. One billion, one trillion, 10 trillion, you know, is achievable because you can always take the other branch of the non-determinism, right? Always take the else branch and just keep incrementing count and increment it ad infinitum. So the abstract interpreter is not wrong, right? But it doesn't capture the probabilistic semantics. In the probabilistic semantics, if you run 10 to the 7 simulations, which is a huge number for a program this small, okay, more than enough. So then you get a nice looking you know, distribution of the values of counts measured at the end of the program. So I just put a histogram on the values of counts, right? And I'm interested in what's the probability that the value of count you end up with is greater than or equal to 35, that your loop runs for 35 or more times. What's the probability of that? Okay, and if you look at the histogram, it's barely visible. There's like few behaviors. So out of 10 to the 7, you probably get around 100 behaviors or less. Okay? And that's statistically insignificant. So what you have to do is you have to do 10 to the 10 to get something statistically significant. Otherwise, your, you know, your, your statistical test will tell you that the intervals that you can put on, on the probability are, are too large to be meaningful. Right? So you need to run 10 to the 10 or even more simulations, which is an astronomical number. Right? And the point here is that that behavior is very rare. So even though abstract interpretation tells us everything is reachable, which it is, right? concentration of measure tells us that as you get to the tail, the behaviors become rarer and rarer. Okay, so, so the main challenge here is how do we reason about this, the concentration of measure? That some behaviors are getting rare as you, and that's the extra information that you have to add on. Without that, there's no value in doing this kind of analysis. Okay, and there are many approaches to this. All I'm going to show you is one approach, okay? And it works only in some situations, and, and, but it's an interesting approach, I'll show you. So, since I talked about the many approaches, what are the approaches? So, again, there are too many that don't fit in this category, but the nice thing about PowerPoint is you can make these two categories, and I made two categories instead of three, and I said, approach one is called capture the distribution. I'll explain what that is. Approach two is a deductive approach, and I'll explain that in a second. So, our approach in this talk is going to be approach two, but let me explain the two approaches. So what does capturing the distribution mean? So you can think about in abstract terms. In a non-deterministic program, when you do abstract interpretation or model checking, what do you need? You need a representation for sets of states. You can use BDDs, you can use polyhedra, you can use you know, combinations of abstract domains, but what they are representing are sets of program states. Right? In a probabilistic program, you need extra information. You need to capture the distribution among the sets of states. Not just the set that's reachable, but what's the probability of the individual points in the set that's reachable. Okay, and in an infinite state system, you need something more than individual points. You may need a more continuous distribution. So you may need to abstract the distribution. Okay, and, and this kind of approach is called capture the distribution. What you do is you define abstract domains not for sets of states, but for distributions over sets of states. Okay, and this has been done by many. I'm not the first one to talk about this. Uh, David Monio did his thesis on this and he has done some fantastic work in the late 90s, early 2000s on this problem. I'm sure there's work that's been done before Monio, but uh, let me just start somewhere. And then there's been a ton of recent work, including some of our 
work and our PLDI papers also you can think about it as something that falls in this direction. Right? What's the flavor of this kind of work? Well, you take existing abstract domains that you know like polyhedra or you can take any existing abstract domain and you simply attach a number and that's the simplest incarnation of this idea. There are much more complicated incarnations. Simplest one is this. Take an abstract domain, slap a number on it and the number gives you an upper bound on how much measure resides in that set. So you can have three objects, three polyhedra, the left one says 0.3 which is an upper bound on how much measure does your distribution put in this one. Okay. Uh, the middle one says 0.4 which is an upper bound on how much measure you put there and, and the idea here is okay you, you don't know where how the distribution s looks like inside this set. All you know is that if you integrate this set or sum up inside this set the answer should be less than or equal to 0.3. Yeah, that's a way of making up an abstract domain and that's David Monio's original abstract domain. Okay? And people like uh, you know, uh, uh, Mike Hicks for example have done a lot more work on this to make it much more uh, scalable and much more uh, robust. Okay? Even in the abstract domain the, uh, the distribution should, should still satisfy all the properties of the distribution. That's right. So, so you say it should be a distribution. Additionally, you are placing these constraints. On this part of the space, you say it's less than or equal to 0.3. Implicitly, everywhere else, it's zero. Right? So, so it's, it's a way of minimally adding on to your existing program analyzer to build some capabilities of talking about probabilistic programs. The biggest problem, however, is loops. If you have loops, especially like this, indefinite loops, loops that don't have any bound on how many times they can run, so if you have a simple for loop for i equals 1 to 100, unroll it and we can all go, right? But if you have a loop like this, right, which does not have an upper bound on how many steps, an absolute upper bound on how many steps it takes, then these kinds of approaches are going to be very bad, which means you have to keep unrolling and keep unrolling and you eventually have to do widening or you have to keep joining, otherwise the number of these disjuncts just blows up, right? So, so then what you have to do is whatever you do loses precision very fast and, and you lose precision on meets so, so every operation that you do you are losing precision and usually the, the unless you do all these other you know um, complicated things that others have uh, suggested if you use Monio's abstract domain usually you'll end up in zero one on most programs because you know it's a good idea but when you have loops it doesn't scale very well it doesn't work very well uh, you have to do a lot more work to loops and, and you can read all these papers and they talk about how much more work you have to do. Okay, what we are going to do is take a different approach, completely orthogonal. Instead of dealing with loops by chasing around the program and doing some symbolic execution or abstract interpretation, what we are going to do is find an invariant, okay, which is the other approach in program verification, right? Find an invariant somehow without necessarily doing propagation and widening, right? There are other ways of finding invariants as we all know. So maybe we can find a loop invariant. The question of course is what's the right notion of a loop invariant for a probabilistic program, okay? And what we will show today is um, we didn't invent this notion. So McIver and Morgan for example pioneered this whole approach of deductive program verification. But their approach is mostly for finite state probabilistic programs. You cannot have these kinds of distributions. You can only have flips and, and it's mostly meant for finite state systems. Okay? Uh, what we are going to show is there is a notion of loop invariant that extends McIver and Morgan okay? and it's called Martingales and it's a very, and the nice thing about it is it's very well known to probabilistic uh, people who do probabilities. If you go to any mathematician who does probabilities and talk to them about Martingales, they know it. I mean it's very well known in probability theory. Lots of books have been published. So what we are going to show is Martingales are the right notion okay? and this notion x plus y minus 2 con we'll show is a martingale. I'll explain what that is in a second. And, and because of that we'll show some, some very interesting properties uh, of estimating probabilities. We'll show that. We'll also show how to reason about termination. Okay. Right. So the one thing I have to note is this kind of approach is less general. If you found a martingale uh, using your technique, you're good, you can do something with it. But there is no guarantee you'll find one, just like everything else in invariant synthesis. So that needs to be said. So one thing I did not say with the same was that you know in uh, uh, you know, traditional programs with non-determinism, you know, I mean, loop invariants always exist. It's just hard to find them. Uh, are you saying that these kinds of loop invariants may not exist as well? Or? Uh, that's a great question. So 
so the the strongest I'm willing to venture right now because I haven't thought about your question is they may not exist in the language that you're interested in and that's true even for loop invariants you may not get a linear loop invariant and it's true even for martingales you won't get a linear martingale but I'm sure there's a construction which is similar which could construct a martingale for you uh, I mean the way you construct the strongest loop invariant is by doing Gödel numbering and, and all kinds of tricks where you won't get that loop invariant you won't actually be able to derive it you know it exists right it's the same I'm sure the same kind of construction can be carried out but I haven't tried it yet uh, but the one thing I can show is maybe you don't find it using the techniques that you have to find it which is very primitive as you can see it's the you know we are barely three or four people have touched this problem so there's not much that has been done so the state is very primitive so we don't know answers to questions like that right so to summarize in our deductive approach we'll find a martingale x plus y minus 2 count and we'll use this nice inequality called Azuma's inequality uh, which works for martingales and we'll show for example that the probability that count is 35 and you haven't still terminated at this point in the program now we can start to put bounds on it we'll show it's upper bounded by 4.410 to the minus 5 even though that's conservative it's a small enough number that any other technique for doing this is going to be expensive because it's a small number right and when you have to find out small probabilities with a lot of confidence you have to put in effort whereas in this case because you found this martingale the amount of effort you put in for finding this is very simple right so 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 this is orthogonal to everything else that you can do okay so all right so without much further ado what's a martingale martingale is a stochastic process so what's a stochastic process then? Stochastic process, in this, in this talk I'll talk about discrete time stochastic processes. These are a bunch of random variables which are just indexed by natural numbers. So x0 is a random variable at time 0. So if you sample from it, you get a value for time 0. Likewise, x1 is a new random variable for time 1. If you sample from it, you get your sample for time 1. So these are just random variables at every point in time you get a new random variable if you sample from it you get a new point in your process so so then you get your stochastic sample path okay um, a martingale is a special kind of stochastic process and this is everything that I'm going to say in my talk this is a message of my talk a martingale is a process which satisfies this very strange looking thing okay what it says is suppose I have seen everything from start of time to n minus 1 I have seen everything that has happened from the beginning of time to current time n minus 1 what is my expectation of what I am going to see in the next step okay so what it says is the expectation of what I am going to see in the next step I don't know what I am going to see in the next step because it's a spread of values it's a random variable in the next step right but the expectation of what I am going to see or the average of what I am going to see in the next step is my current value and I'll, I'll, I'll try and motivate this with an example but this is it I mean if, if you have to say what a martingale is this is the definition and there's a couple of other simple regularity conditions which I'll omit okay so this is all a martingale says the expectation of what I'm going to see in the next step is the current value okay so for example suppose you have a sample path you go along sample 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 and you have v0 as your first zero at time sample v1 as your first time sample vn minus 1 as your n minus 1 at time sample what's the expected value at time n so what you can say is that the average of what you will see at time n is vn minus 1 that's the expectation okay even though you don't know what it will be you know that its average is going to be what is the current value so let me give average you a. Is the current value or the average is what the average of what you would have seen in all distributions where. So the average of that's right. The average of what you would have seen in all possible worlds. It's like a branching time thing, right? So so currently you're at n minus one, and the future is branching away from you, right? There are lots of possible futures, but the average of what you would see in the next time is the current value, or what you would have seen in the next time so let me be it's the current value it's the current value let me give you an example so this example involves gambling so I put in an old currency so suppose you start with zero on us okay so you don't have any money okay um, and you gamble in the following way toss a coin okay and if you turn up heads you get one ana from the bank and if you turn up tails you lose one ana Okay, so 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 you're going to keep playing this game ad infinitum so so if you lose one ana you get to minus one ana which means you're owing one ana to the bank 
okay and you keep playing this game um, in the second time step you can see you can get either get two or zero from that from the top branch or you can get zero or minus two from the bottom branch and you keep playing this game so let xi be the fortune the amount of money that you have or that you owe if it's negative at the iteration number i let that be xi you can easily see that xi is a martingale so it's a first textbook example of a martingale why is that well what's the suppose xi is the amount of money you have in hand or you owe right now what's the expectation of how much money you will have in one step half probability xi plus 1 with other half probability xi minus 1 cancel out you get xi so suppose you have 100 anas right now you will expect to have 100 anas in the next step okay that so that that makes it a martingale so if you have 1000 you will expect to have 1000 in the next step okay so that kind of a process is called a martingale it's a strange definition but once you get used to this then everything in probability theory can actually be understood very nicely in, in terms of martingales it's super fundamental to probability theory even though as computer scientists we don't quite encounter this randomized algorithm people do they use this all the time um, right so let me give you the second example of martingale after the textbook example which is the example we are interested in so take this program I've simplified it just a little bit to fit it in the slide um, and print x plus y minus two times count every time you're on the loop head just print it and if you terminate just keep printing the last value you printed every one second just keep printing it okay and imagine that as your stochastic process okay now question is I'm going to write this notation to say the value of x plus y minus 2 count at step n plus 1 okay what's the expected value of this guy given you know the value of x at n the value of y at n the value of count at n what is the expected value okay so with two-thirds probability two-thirds probability x becomes x plus 1 y becomes y plus 2 count becomes count plus 1 with one-thirds probability x becomes x x remains x y n plus 1 remains y n and count becomes count plus 1 so do a simple calculation and you get back x plus y minus 2 times count so what it says is the expectation of x plus y minus 2 count at the n plus 1 th iteration of the loop is the value of x plus y minus 2 times count at the current iteration okay and and this makes it a martingale in the the only small thing is we don't condition it on x plus y minus count we actually condition it on the state and in martingale theory this is called a martingale that's adapted to the program state it's in terms of the program state it's a martingale and that's perfectly fine nothing changes even though you don't put the, the random variable here okay so 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 with with that we can now start to build upon martingales and programs right so we we have made the connection we can start to build upon it right so then the other notion is super martingales which I'll come to towards the very end and now a martingale would have been this equals xn minus 1 in a super martingale it just becomes less than or equal to okay, and then trivially a martingale is a super martingale if you're equal you're also less than equal to and if x and minus x are both super martingales then x is a martingale okay so these are all very trivial concepts I mean so I'm not going to go deep into this if uh, there are books written on this go to the library if you're interested you can look this up it's it's fairly straightforward so, so if you go back one slide uh -huh. uh, so in this case the, the, the process that you came up with here is conditioned on the state of x y and count only again not not before oh that. because I don't is need that, it that's just to it. that's just to uh, but is that going to be the general structure of the martingales you come up with or, or not necessarily so so it doesn't have to be Markovian that's what you're asking so it doesn't have to be Markovian all it says is the value is the value at time n but but that so, so the expectation is the value at time n right but the process the distribution may depend on everything that happened in the past so it doesn't have to be Markovian but we are working with programs and programs are Markovian if you know the current state you know everything else that's known to be known about the future of the program you don't need to know how you came upon the current state right so programs in that sense are Markovian right so so therefore and that depends on you your definition of state being appropriate right but let's assume all that is true right so so then uh, we just need x n y n count n truly but in general you will need to have everything in your conditional distribution but then you will just depend on n minus 1 the expression will depend on it. It's a very subtle point, but uh, 
<laughs> I'm, I'm glad you raised it, but it's really, really subtle. What the point you raised is pretty subtle. So in, in programs, you'll typically not need. You will typically things. not need. Um, um, and in general, you won't need it, except that that's because you're only talking about expectation. You're not talking about Xn itself. You're only talking about expectation. So therefore, you won't need it. But Xn itself may depend in arbitrary ways. Um, that's very, very deep. Uh, I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, right. So. We can now say, okay, what's a martingale expression? So martingale expression, you can say, take a probabilistic program. Its state is the location, valuations to the program variables. And a martingale expression could be a simple expression on the program variable. So that would be the flow insensitive version. There's a flow sensitive version, which could be different expressions labeling different locations of the program. And that would be martingale expressions. And, and the criterion is, I'm just writing it for the flow insensitive one. Flow sensitive is, you can imagine how it's going to look. It's going to look a lot more LaTeX, but not, not going to be any more informative. So what it says is, the expected value of the expression as a function of Xn, given everything that's happened in the past, is expression of Xn minus 1. It's the martingale condition that, that I stated previously. That's just going to, now you're not putting it on program expressions. OK? And likewise, super martingales will be less than or equal to. Okay? Uh, there's one, one thing I want to quickly mention. There's a for all quantifier here, which I haven't placed. Uh, there's, it's a for all quantification on xn, xn minus 1, x0, just like you will have in, in a whole triple, for example. Uh, okay. so question? question? So uh, I, I was, I'm trying to uh, understand the difference between flow insensitive versus flow insensitive here. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the program itself, by the notation L comma X vector, I could think about it as a sequence of labels. Correct. Is that thing about it? And then uh, here, the uh, exp the martingale doesn't mention any particular line number. That's is right. That, is that how you should think about it? So it's it's like a single martingale for the whole program, but but you don't need. I mean, in many cases, when you have different expressions at different locations in the program, then the martingale has to be thought of as a function of L and X where it's a, it's a if then else expression. If so, L is L0, then it's expression 0. Yeah, so the, the example you gave, the, with the example of the loop, right. uh, I, you know, I, I didn't think about all these complications, but naturally I thought about that expression as associated with the loop, uh, head. The loop head. That's right. That's right. So you were there, actually, it is flow sensitive. It is flow sensitive in that sense. It's at the loop head, but the way I will model the loop is I will take everything that happens in the loop as a single transition. Uh, in that case, you know, it doesn't really matter. There's just going to be one location in my transition but system. What about the, all the steps? That's right. When you have nested loops, for example, right? Then you will have two cut points, and then you will have to have different martingale expressions at cut points. We have examples where we show it's needed. I'll, I'll give you an example as well. Uh, but I didn't want to put that whole condition in there because then it starts becoming tedious. Um, right. So let me give you a very, you know, since uh, you also asked, it was quite timely. Uh, let me give you very quick, uh, you know, fly through on how do you prove that a particular expression is a martingale. It looks a lot like, you know, proving invariance. Okay, it, it has that flavor. So what? Let's take this expression, x plus y minus two count. We would like to prove that it's actually a martingale. Okay, so then, how do you now chop up the program? in a way that makes it easier to prove it. Otherwise, it, it becomes harder. You have to go into all these issues like flow sensitive and so on. right? So one way we chop up the program is we look at the cut points. We just add one cut point to the end of the program. not, you know, And then we add a cut point at the while loop. We think of all of this green part as the initialization of the program. So uh, since it's a stochastic program and we want to throw away non-determinism, all variables have to be initialized. If you let the initialization be non-deterministic, you can sneak in non-determinism into your program, and we don't want that, right? If you want it to be purely stochastic, then you have to treat all of this as initialization of the program. Okay, so now that you have that, uh, we have a way of looking at transitions where our transition has two parts. One part is the, the guard of the transition, x plus y less than or equal to 10, which says you're going to take the loop, and then there's a fork, and this is a probabilistic fork. Okay, so we have this transition system defined in our CAV paper. Okay, and, and the reason we do this, it makes it very convenient to, to reason about probabilistic programs. It's not a big deal, but you have to have some notation for how you're going to slice and dice a program, right? And if you use a CFG, then it's not, 
it's not that easy. Just take this, make it into a CFG, it becomes a little harder. So if you do a little bit of work and make it into this transition systems with these forks, probabilistic forks, which I'll explain in a second, then life, makes, life becomes easier. And in this case, you have two forks. In one fork with one third probability, you can take it and you do these actions. In the other fork with two thirds probability, you take it and you can do these, you know, you do these actions and you end up back in the red location for this fork as well as that fork. So, so our transitions become slightly more complicated than the traditional transition system or the traditional actions that programs can take. Okay, and, and this is just meant to make life easier for us. Make x the previous variable uh, and x prime, y prime, count prime, the next state variable really standard. And what you're trying to prove is for all x prime, y prime, count prime, expectation of x prime, y prime, count prime, this guy is equal to, you know, x plus y minus 2 count. So it's, it's like a, you have to discharge that, that thing. And in many cases, you just do rewriting. But I'll show you in a second. So, so, so the, the difference between the CFG and this is that you're saying that the body of the whole loop you sort of think about as atomic. Is that the difference? That's right. I think of it as atomic. Right, and and it's still not quite. Sh I'm not quite hundred percent sure that you know I can defend every action that I have taken to move from here to that that kind of a transition system. But but with this kind of a transition system model, it makes life much easier for me. Otherwise, I have to now start talking about flow sensitive martingales from the right from the get go. I have to have a different expression here, 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 and and so that makes it harder. So I, I just made life easier on myself. And, and in this kind of a model, you can now start to calculate the expectation of this guy. Okay, it's a, uh, and you can use precondition computation to calculate it. And, and when you do the simplification, you get x plus y minus 2 count. And that discharges the, the assumption, the martingale proof thing that you have to prove that across every of these transitions now with the forks, the, the value, expected value of the martingale at the next step is the value at the current step. Right? So you have to prove that at every, every transition. And it looks a lot like checking inductive invariance. Um, it's not the same, but it looks a lot like it. It's, you have to go across every transition and prove it. Um, there is no initialization for martingales because um, you don't need it. Right. So let's now think about proving properties using martingales. Okay, so since I'm running out of time, I'm going to try and move fast. So one of the first things I'll explain is Azuma's inequality. Okay, this is going to be the basis for trying to find out how to prove probabilities with martingales. So one of the things is, uh, let me try and explain Azuma's inequality. Okay? So suppose you start with y as a martingale. Instead of x, I'm just changing notation, calling it y. Okay? And one of the conditions you need is the absolute change in y is bounded in every step. So yn cannot be c more or c less than than y n minus one, so it's absolute change y n minus y n minus one is bounded in every step. Okay, and to illustrate, I start at y zero, the initial value. Okay, and the red curve, which looks like like a stochastic process, assume that's the value of the martingale over time, and x-axis is the number of steps. Okay, now what I'm interested in is knowing the probability that starting from y zero, the the martingale goes t more than y0. For some number t, I want to know what's the probability that it goes t more than y0 okay, at the nth step. So there are two things involved here. I want to know at step n, what's the probability that yn is t more than y0. There is a symmetric version where it's t less. Okay? And Azuma's theorem shows the following. So it says probability yn greater than or equal to y0 plus t is less than equal to, and this is the interesting part, it's exponential decreasing on minus t squared, which means that as t goes more and more and more, it gets less and less and less probable. Okay, so the, the message here is that martingales concentrate around their starting point. They, don't, they, they won't go too far. At least at any fixed point in time, they won't go too far. Okay? Uh, so so that's, that's an interesting observation about martingales. Okay? So, so they tend to stay after some finite number of steps close to where they started. Okay, and you can use that in very interesting ways and I'll show you one way to use that. So, so that, that, that equation is in terms of absolute values of y. That's right, not the expectation, the absolute value. Which means that any possible value you get in the nth step must be c bounded from, you know, 
so if your current value is 100, the next step you can be between 110 or 90 if C is 10. Or if C is 100, then you can be between 200 or 100. I don't care how much the C is, even though it goes into the factor downstairs. It can be any number, but it has to be finite. It can't be infinite. Okay, and so there are. The, what is the top equation? Y and minus y and minus one. This one? Yeah. Oh, this this says okay. So y is a martingale. So it's a stochastic process. So y n is the value of y at the nth step, minus value of y at the n minus one nth step. Absolute value is bounded is less than or equal to c, which means. So are there, are, are there martingales that don't satisfy this? You sure. Can, you can still have martingales. Yeah, just keep adding a Gaussian, uh, some summation of Gaussians, right? Uh, oh, I see. But the way, I, the way I should understand is that the Dajou was inequality holds for a martingale that also satisfies the original condition. That's right. Now, if you don't satisfy, for example, summation of Gaussians, then you go to Chernoff Hofting bounds. There are, but there are other inequalities. So this is just one inequality for martingales. There are other inequalities that are true, like Chernoff Hofting, for example, works for summation of Gaussians, right? Um, but there, the condition is independence. What you sum up at every step must be independent. Uh, so, so basically you have a whole book, I'll show you, I have it in my bag, you have a whole book of theorems like these, which talk about different conditions under which you get concentration of measure. Okay? And, and this is one condition that's very important, where you get concentration of measure whenever you have a martingale with this boundedness condition. But there are other inequalities for other conditions. So, so it's, it's a very rich field in, in, in mathematics. And what is the intuition behind the C? That means your program is not going to work. That's right. That's right. The expression doesn't change too much. Uh, right. I mean, in the, in the coin, the gambling example, you said you can either lose one more than what you've lost or That's gain right. one more than what you've lost. So, so you're, you're always bounded. And so you can't do something like x equals 2 times x. You cannot. You can do it, but your martingale cannot. That cannot happen to your martingale. So if your martingale is x by two to the n, that's okay. So this is why is actually a program expression. Not that's a program expression. That's that's right. Yeah. So so for example, uh, I can show you now how we can apply Azuma's inequality. And some of the problems or future work is also very clear when I show you how I do this. Okay. So I want to do probability count equals 35 and x plus y less than or equal to 10 at this point in the program. Meaning being, what's the probability that I reach 35 and I haven't yet terminated? That's another way of asking, what's the probability I reach here and count is greater than or equal to 35? It's the same question I asked uh, way back, right? Okay, so I've reformulated the question. Okay, I know the martingale I want to use, x plus y minus 2 count. So how do I use it? So let me take you through some of the steps. And this is the part where you know, we'll have to mechanize. And, and I'll show you some of the challenges that come up. Okay? So suppose you want to do this. We want to use Azuma's inequality. That's why I introduced it. Okay? So let's do this. So let's look at this expression x plus y minus 2 count. Okay? So initially, I claim that it's between at n equals 0, n being time, it's between minus 7 and plus 7. x plus y minus 2 count. At the start, is between minus 7, count to 0, you can forget it, and plus 7. Okay? And I would like to know at n equals 35, what's the probability that x plus y is less than or equal to 10 and count equals 35. That's what I want to find out. I use one step of Farkash lemma and I get a consequence in terms of my martingale. Because my martingale is not in terms of these two, my martingale is a different expression. But I can do a simple trick. I can say those two, x plus y less than or equal to 10, count equals 35, in turn imply this, x plus y minus 2 count less than or equal to 60. Okay? So therefore, to estimate the probability using Azuma's theorem, what I have to show is in the best case, the martingale starts from this step, minus 7, and goes to minus 60 in 35 steps. If I know the probability of that, that's an upper bound. Martingale is just an expression x plus y minus 2 count, right? That's right. Go back one step. So you have, so those two are the, that's the property you want to check. That's What's right. The probability of this conjunction. That's so right. What are you now doing? You are now rewriting? Rewriting it as an implication on the Martingale expression. So if this holds, this implies this on the Martingale expression. Why is that? You can use Farkash lemma. x plus y less than or equal to 10, 2 times count equals 70, then this is less than or equal to minus 6. It's, it's a standard move that you can make and you can say together they imply this bound 
on the martingale expression because that's the expression that you can work with. I see. So you want to say that if you, if you want to calculate the probability of some other uh, state, you want to convert that in into a probability on the martingale taking a value. That's right. You want to convert it the probability on the martingale taking a value, right? And then you can you can put Azuma's inequality. You find the right numbers to plug in, which is part of the challenge in mechanizing this whole thing. And when you find the right numbers to plug in, you get an answer right away. Okay, and, and here I just did very simple calculation, always kept rounding up to the nearest integer. So it's not it's not very conservative. It's pretty conservative, right? So but you still get a good answer. You get okay, it's less than or equal to four point five ten to the minus one, right? Just by knowing the martingale you can do that, right? Um, Right, but the challenge is this is this is kind of like theorem proving now. You are you are given this martingale and you are allowed Azuma's inequality, uh, but but the point is there is some human guidance, right? I use some of my intuition here, and the challenge, of course, is how do you mechanize this whole thing as much as you can? So this part, whatever I told you in this slide, can be mechanized. We've we've done that. It's not it's not too hard, but of course, if it's a different pattern, it fails, right? So so we have to watch out for that. Uh, for example, we can ask a very simple question: Count greater than or equal to 35, and I haven't yet terminated. Okay, it's not the original question, but it's a related question. Now, how do you find out? Okay, what we can do is we have to do a series summation, but that's that's a little bit harder to do. Okay, but but you know these kinds of mechanization is harder to do. But but if you can conquer the the act of mechanizing this, then you can. Start to use martingales to prove some very cool things about these programs, right? So, so that's that's the hope. So, let me very quickly go through this part uh, because I'm already running out of time. Uh, so, we can talk about two things: mechanizing the discovery of martingales. How do you find these martingales in the first place without having to provide them, and computing the probabilities using bump. So, so those are two things we have to mechanize. So, I'm sorry, can I cut to the last Sure. Thing? So, are these useful just to uh, for all kinds of probabilistic invariants uh, are you know mainly for termination or it doesn't matter uh, so right now I'm, I'm the, this part of the talk I'm talking about the probabilistic invariants or, or proving establishing bounds on probabilities I'll give you a quick overview on termination like a couple of slides overview as so, well so the example that you gave right now it was not about termination no it wasn't about termination but there is a version where you'll also we can also use the martingale to prove termination because you just said like 35 is a particular count and that's you're saying that's very low that's right, right. Yeah. So, so this is for probabilities, finding probabilities. There, the CAP paper has two parts: finding the probabilities and proving termination. So, and we show that martingales are useful for both. So, I'll I'll give you a two-slide overview on that towards the end. Uh, so, how do you discover martingales? Okay. So, if you know anything about the work we did in the past, then you will have an idea of how we do this, but let me explain. Um, so the goal is, given a program, we want to synthesize martingales. Okay? So how do we do that? Well, we do the standard trick. Assume a template expression for the martingale. So at every location L, X, assume that there's an unknown expression CL of X plus DL. It's a linear expression in this case. Otherwise, you can use a nonlinear expression if you, if you so wish. Okay? But you have to templatize it. That's how we discover it. And, and then derive constraints on the unknown coefficients. That's how we do it. Okay, and what we have done in our CAP paper is extended the constraint-based approach using Farkas lemma. So we have taken that approach and extended it. Rather than synthesizing invariants, we can now synthesize martingales using that. It's not hard to imagine how we are, we are going to do it. Let me give you a, a very quick two-slide overview on how this is done. Let's take this program. Okay, let's take the transition model that I have. And let's say cx, c sub x of x plus c sub y times y plus c sub count times count is the unknown martingale that we want to synthesize. Now I have to translate that into constraints on c sub x, c sub y, c sub count. Right? In this case, it becomes really simple. In general, you will need to use Farkas lemma. Okay? And here what I do is I write the expression expectation of the next step in terms of this arithmetic. So the arithmetic is quite easy to do. And when you do this arithmetic, you get something that looks like this. So you get c sub x, x prime, c sub x, x, c sub y, y prime, c sub y, y, and so on. But you have this extra 2 by 3 c x plus 4 by 3 c y plus c count that's sticking along there. Now, if you wish that away, if you say that whole thing is 0 at the end, it will magically become a martingale. Okay? Now, this can be mechanized. We use Farkas lemma. 
and we have a systematic approach in our paper this is just an example I'm just showing you how it works right right so you get this constraint 2 by 3 cx uh, plus 4 by 3 cy plus c count is 0 and if you satisfy this you get a martingale right and so immediately solve it you get two martingales you get 2x minus y is a martingale x plus y minus 2 count this is a simple example but we have a more more systematic way of doing the same thing right using constraint based invariant generation right so we applied this on some other examples like we have an example where we model a submarine getting a navigation fix submarine surface get a GPS fix and then they go underwater where they may not have GPS so what they do is they integrate their last known position and every move that they have made since then every direction that they have traveled and how far they have traveled how fast they have traveled and how long they have traveled they integrate that to find where they are right now to estimate where they are right now and you can think of sensor errors in, in estimating their, their direction for example you can think of water currents that are pushing them along and if you model them as stochastic the question is can you analyze the resulting program so we made a program up modeling a submarine modeling some stochastic moves of the submarine the noise that comes in and then we wanted to find martingales we synthesized martingales for example uh, we showed that the, the state x actual models the actual x position x estimate models the estimated x position and we get a martingale that says x actual minus x estimate is a martingale what that means is those two things remain very close to each other x actual and x estimate the difference behaves like a martingale so those are useful things to know in in examples like this and the program is already bigger than what i can fit in a slide but it's there in our paper and you can you can take a look at it okay so this is to give you an example of what the kind of things we can do here right so let me give you a one slide overview on termination okay so let's take a simple program uh, here is a program that terminates okay and the way you prove termination is using the ranking function 10 minus x what's what's great about this ranking function well it's lower bounded whenever it hits zero the loop terminates right and at every step it takes a decrease right but suppose you replace the point one by a uniform random number between minus five and five point two then what right then you can start to say okay maybe the program doesn't terminate right or maybe it does how, how do you reason about termination what's the status of 10 minus x now so what we'll observe here is two things one is 10 minus x does not decrease in every step it can increase okay but in expectation it decreases so it behaves like a martingale a super martingale okay and what we are going to show is that's enough that proves that the loop is almost surely terminating okay so it's a, it's a easy application of martingales okay so what what are we talking about so we are talking about what we call super martingale ranking functions or what we call smurfs okay and the idea is you want an expression such that the expectation of expression at the nth step is less than or equal to the expectation at the value at n minus 10 minus some epsilon it looks a lot like a ranking function okay except that you have an expectation here if you didn't have the expectation it would be like a ranking function it would be a ranking function except that there is an e here which makes it a smurf okay um, and it's also a super martingale that's why I call it a smurf right so the, and the other thing is in expectation you decrease and and when you hit the end the loop terminates but unlike Azuma's inequality there is no need that the absolute change in the expression is bounded all those conditions don't don't matter to me anymore just this condition okay epsilon needs to be a small but fixed constant it can be it needs to be positive and fixed that's all we need for epsilon so the main theorem in our paper is that if a loop has a smurf then it terminates almost surely okay uh, the proof very interestingly enough is nothing like the proof that you use for ranking functions which is using induction right it's using a form of reflection that you use to prove or well foundedness right uh, there's no such reasoning in this kind of a proof so we don't use the fact that the, the domain is well founded even though it looks well founded uh, what we instead end up using is something called Dube's forward convergence theorem which is a standard result on martingale so if you open up any martingale book within the first 15 pages you will get to this result and it's like the fourth or fifth theorem they'll prove it's a major result and we use this result to to actually prove that fact which is very interesting so we don't we don't quite know what's what's the status sorry I'm running over time so for example in this program 
we find 10 minus x minus y is a smurf, right? Uh, so in this program, for example, we find a flow sensitive smurf. So at location L0, it's 1. Location L1, it's 0. I, I won't go into the details. Uh, we modeled a large, and this is fairly large. I haven't, I haven't put everything here. It's like 50 lines or so. But this is a program that models roulette. So it's a program that models a betting strategy for roulette. We have the person, as long as their money is more than 10, they keep betting. And once money becomes less than 10, they, they exit. And, and then there's all the probabilities that can happen in roulette. Okay? So for example, can you prove termination? We did. And the super martingale we found was money. So money is the thing that you end up losing. Right? So all right. And so in terms of ongoing research, I want to do some stuff with hybrid systems, which is my usual hunting ground. So, but there, I need to work with continuous time martingales and not discrete time martingales. And life is much harder with continuous time martingales. Everything I said in this talk does not hold for continuous time martingales. So we have to rediscover things there. Um, what are we doing right now? So we are doing some interesting things with what's called the Doob martingale method of bounded differences. Uh, if you take up any book on randomized algorithms, you'll find a chapter on it. It's, it's a wonderful idea, and we are trying to mechanize it. Um, so and that's mostly it. We are trying to mechanize the inference so that we can apply whatever I told you much more robustly to a larger variety of programs. Right? Um, and, and that's mostly it. Uh, thanks for listening. And uh, you know, I'll take any questions you have offline for lunch. Okay. <laughs>